So how do you get into the world of property development? And indeed, how do you become a successful property developer? Watch this video as Martin and I will go through all of the details. Hi everyone, my name is Simon Mishevich from Optimize Accountants and welcome to this YouTube channel. Today, I'm delighted to have Martin Rapley with me today talking about property development. Most of my previous videos have been around property investing, but you know, most people are talking about property development and is it easy to do or is it impossible to get into? Well, I'm delighted to have Martin with me today. So, hi Martin, how is it going today? Yeah, it's really good, thanks Simon. It's uh, really good to be here speaking to you this afternoon. And Martin, why don't we kick things off with uh, just a bit of background of where you've come from the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years um, <laughs> into the world of property and where you are right now with your uh, company? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, so my background is working for building contractors. I left school. Originally, I was a quantity surveyor. So that's the person who looks after the finances for building contractors. Um, I drifted sideways into management of building, building construction projects, mostly because I got excited by the logistics of carrying out the projects. And I was doing some very high-end uh, yeah, quality work in places like the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Bank of England and the Stock Exchange, where the work was logistically challenged because of you know, security issues and public and noise restrictions and all of that. So I, I got to a place where I was kind of managing the whole thing. And I've been doing that for, I don't know, probably 18, 20 years or so. Got myself up. I was kind of number two in a business where the MD wasn't really overly dynamic. We were coming out of the recession in 2008, 2009. And you know, I, I, he, he kept saying I could take the company over from him. And I'm watching this company that's slowly going down the pan. Um, so in 2011, I bit the bullet and right at the end of 2011, I left. And I couldn't think of anything better to do than set up my own business, which was exactly what I did. It was a complete clone of the company I'd worked for. But what I hadn't realized was that I, wasn't, I couldn't easily get all of those same good quality blue chip clients because my business hadn't been traded long enough. Even though I had the experience and they were all happy to work with me, they couldn't work with my business. So I was out in the, in, the, you know, in the open market looking for work. And what was interesting was most of my clients or, uh, or most of the people I met were property investors. I was advertising on, on the internet and I was meeting property investors. And then very soon afterwards, someone I'd met at a networking event said, you should go to this property networking meeting. They'll want builders. So I literally did that. I went along waiting for my little point where I could stand up for 30 seconds and introduce myself and then I met more property investors and what I found was in I'd been running the business for about 12 months uh, most of my clients were pro had been property investors nearly all of my inquiries have been property investors and yet m very few of those property investors really seemed to know how to do the refurbishment they were totally reliant on me as a contractor and yet I knew full well they were getting quotes off other contractors that weren't giving them the service that I was giving them. I was telling them play, times when they needed planning permission. They didn't even know they needed planning permission. I was helping them understand building regulation drawings. And I was finding this odd thing where they were saying to me, Martin, I can only afford £30,000 on this refurbishment. Otherwise, the deal doesn't stack up. And I'd never, I couldn't work that because I was thinking, but if it's going to cost £60,000, then you need to buy the house £30,000 cheaper to make it stack up. And I, I couldn't kind of comprehend all of that, but it was all really exciting. And I'd been going to a number of property meetings by then and learning about options and exchange with delay completion, which was just this whole world of excitement that seemed to fit alongside my 28 years experience, but they didn't quite meld together. So I went off to a one day introduction course, uh, one of Simon Zucci's quick start courses, to see how my business might interface with property investing. Um, and of course, in that quick start one day course, there was no mention of refurbishment or development or anything. It was all motivated sellers and striking out deals and relationships. Um, but the long short was Sarah, my wife, that's Sarah in the picture here. Um, she came along with me on that day. She, we got a two for one deal. So she came along for free. 
uh, didn't really want to be there, but by lunchtime had realised that property investing could get her out of her fairly mundane admin accounts job that she was in. So we ended up jumping in, learning you know, property investing. We did Simon's one-year course in the end um, and, and eventually got Sarah out of her business. I, meanwhile, had picked up some work with a really reputable local developer so I was learning property investing. I was also learning developing, so the front end of developing, about acquisition of sites, putting together schedules of work, um, tendering process, and bolting that to what I knew as the back end of the process. Um, and and we, we were out getting property. We were buying property. We were coming to becoming property developers. But every time we went out becoming property investors, the wheels fell off the business because we couldn't focus on our clients from consulting basis um, and I, I was really struggling to build this business because we we were trying to build a portfolio and in the end we said we've got to make a decision here and the decision was that we would go and build the D, the consultancy business and park property investing for a while because property investing wasn't bringing us enough enough cash flow on a regular basis we had cash flow but it wasn't enough to live on and all the time we were out looking for more deals there wasn't enough money coming in. So we said, let's concentrate on consultancy. The consultancy, which was project management and cost consultancy um, and contracts and things like that, drifted also into training and mentoring. Um, and then that training and mentoring is now a little bit more of the focus of the project, uh, of the business than the consultancy, um, although I still do consultancy. And actually what's happened now is we've come full circle, the business is now stable, we've got a team around us, um, and we're now about property investing again, but with more time to do that property investing, and of course, loads more experience along the way, having worked with, I don't know, you know hundreds of property investors in that kind of six year gap that was in the middle of all of that lot or so. So that's kind of where I am now, running a business of consultancy, training and mentoring, all relating to um, yeah, construction, development, refurbishment of, of property investing properties. And, and just coming on to full circle on that, Martin, I think you and I obviously came uh, across one another with uh, Simon Zucci's Property Mastermind, uh, as well as a, a number of people who I've now interviewed. I've just interviewed Mike Bristow, of mm. crowd property and we'll talk about that later on in terms of how people get into property development um but for anyone listening to that in terms of the dynamics which was really interesting listening to martin you know people do talk about investments do people do talk about their business and construction whatever it might be professional services the one thing i kind of pick up i don't know if you agree martin is that robert kiyosaki's book the cash flow quadrant was a fantastic book and it often talks about the dynamic between having a business and having passive investments. And what he pretty much alluded, Robert Kiyosaki I'm talking about here, he, he talked about business was the one that generated the most of the cash for your investments then to take over. Is that pretty much echo what you've said? Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose some things happen more by accident. You know, we, some, some of what we've done has been planned but some of it is a little bit by accident. And what's interesting is, you know, when COVID hit, and I, I suddenly, I had seven projects on the go when COVID hit, and five of them stopped immediately. So suddenly I'm only earning two sevenths of what I was earning. And in fact, one of them was a tiny little project, so that wasn't really earning me anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and whereas we'd had these on, online training courses, and some other resources online. And what we suddenly saw was that they were, in many ways, COVID proof. And what we saw was that people were buy, still buying some of my online products. Um, and in fact, we've probably sold more online products in the last you know, 12 weeks than we had in the previous 12 weeks to that. And we hadn't, re we hadn't really done anything to our funnel. What we've been doing over the last 12 weeks, actually, and fingers crossed it gets turned on next week, is really turn on this funnel properly and we've improved all of the marketing side of that to really mean that the co the business will be a lot more sustainable going forwards and of course now fortunately some of the projects are starting to re restart um, but we'll also have we've had time to kind of 
to refocus really so yeah yes some things are planned but some things also happen by accident um and, and i think you know the one thing i've learned over all of the years is you've got to find time to plan and um yeah think about what you're doing and when i look at when we were floundering around in the wilderness for a while as we were you know 2013 into 14 we never stopped to plan we never stopped to think what we were doing so of course we just bumbled around with no focus then we started focusing and we got property and then we started focusing and sorting the business out and then we focused again on getting property again so you know focus whatever you're doing think about what you're doing and thinking about how where your income's coming from and making it as 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 prove you know as 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 as, rich, as robust as you can i think i think the the phrase always comes to mind if you fail to plan you plan to fail uh, talking about kind of getting back to kind of the property masterminders and free people that get into property investing for me there's a huge difference between property investments and property developments and just before this video recording we talked about people refurbishing a house thinking well that's property development and actually that's far from the truth what's your take on property investing and the key differences uh, on contrast to property development uh, I, th I think um, the, 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 the line between the two is very very blurred and gray without any doubt because, because many people would say if you're buying a property let's say you're buying a house and you convert it into an HMO, then you are doing development work. You are bringing in uh, a, a builder and you're managing a team and probably an architect as well. And, and it doesn't take long before that drift morphs into buying a commercial unit and converting that into two flats or something like that. I, I, th I think the, the principal difference though is that if you are a property investor, you are earning your income in the form of cash flow pretty much on a monthly basis okay you've got a period up front where you're carrying out the refurbishment but you're holding that stock and you're getting cash on a monthly basis in the form of rent whereas if you're a developer you're primarily doing projects where you're not earning cash flow because you are primarily selling those developments on at the end. Yes, you might be uh, developing them and holding them for the longer term, but then that in many ways goes into a, into a property investing portfolio. So I think that the, the principal thing is as a developer, and this is something I learned you know, a long time ago, was that development can be a very slow way to get rich. But if you get it wrong, it can also be a very slow way to get poor or even go bust. And you won't even see it coming, unfortunately, because, for instance, you could spend 12 months developing out a scheme and then the property market crashes and you can't sell your scheme or you can't refinance it to get your money back out. And there's nothing you could have done about that, no matter how well you ran it. That is an outside factor. Um, and I think that's that's where a lot of property investors go wrong. They forget that. Yes, you can earn good money on development, but it's not going to come for a long time. Can you put food on the table for all of that duration without you know, earning anything? Because it doesn't matter if you're going to earn 100 grand profit in 18 months' time if you can't put food on the table for family in the meantime. I mean, from one of the distinct differences in listening to you about um, the type of development, which is quite sexy subject, is obviously converting commercial to residential. We'll talk about that later on, but the whole subject of property investing, I think you can buy a property, have it purchased, refurbished and rented out within a three month period on average, I would say. Now, if you're doing property development, that's a whole different ballgame. That could be one to two years. And that echoes back to your Absolutely. point of, you know, that could be a huge amount of hole in your cash flow. Um, which could really affect people. So if you are thinking about property investing uh, and then thinking straight away moving to development, I would say probably just watch other people. Would you agree with that? Yeah, without any doubt. There's, there's quite a big step in process between converting an HMO and even converting a commercial unit to residential. There's a lot more things to think about in there. And, and 
yeah, most of those things to think about are actually before the project starts. Mm. Um, you know, because ultimately, once you've got the project, you've still got your bathrooms and the kitchens and all of those things to think about. But you've got a lot more pre-preparation to do in the, in the development project, which is why it adds so much time. And then, of course, invariably, what we'd call, you know, kind of real development needs planning. Well, you know, three months can easily go just trying to get your planning over the line without any kind of hiccup or delays or anything else that goes goes in there. Um, and, of course, bigger projects take longer to tender. So, yeah, you're dead right, Simon. You know, anything up to two years. Uh, you know, even bear in mind, you, you develop a unit through, let's say you convert a commercial unit and you've got four flats. You've still got to sell four flats before you get cash in your pocket. Mm-hmm. The first three plus repays all your loans. The profit is only in that last one. So you've got to sell four flats to get any cash in your pocket. So the bigger the development, the more flats you've got to sell before you earn anything from it, which is just time again. And for me, I got into property development. For anyone that kind of watches my videos and things that I just talk about tax, I've done a few developments. And I have to be honest, I stopped doing them because I am really um, not very patient uh, when it comes to local authorities who drag their heels with their planning permissions and saying signing things off, I mean, even to the slips of your bricks, kind of saying, oh, we don't like the shade. I mean, crazy. Um, and then you having to deal with architects and solicitors and so on and so forth. I think you've got to be the right type of person to do developments. I'm certainly not. Um, but... W- w- your views on someone being patient versus impatient and being property development? Any uh, views so, on that? Well, well, I think development is a long-term thing. So you've got to be happy that it is a long-term project. And some people you know, want to get their teeth into a long-term project. And if you've got cash coming in from another business or from a, a property portfolio, then it doesn't matter if it takes a long time. But yeah, if you are impatient, then you know, development may not be the thing for you because there is no such thing as a fast development and and perhaps i can just add something into here i manage development projects for other clients developers property investors the biggest development i do for myself is house to hmos and flat conversions and refurbishments why is that because first of all i don't want to wait 12 24 months for my cash secondly it takes up my time when I can be earning cash working for clients. Um, And thirdly, there's a huge amount of risk. And my days of wanting to take risk was probably 10 years ago when I was a little bit more prepared to take some risk. Whereas now I'm thinking, I don't really need all of this risk. I'll get my kick out of managing development projects at someone else's risk, doing it for them and let them take the risk if the market crashes. And that is me saying, I know how to do it. I've been doing it for years, but I'm not doing it because it's a high risk strategy. And it's not where I want to be in my career any longer. I want to, you know, I want to be easing out of my career in the next five years, not trying to pay off a development that went the wrong way because we hit a recession or the market just dipped at the wrong time for me. Mm. It's interesting you should say that. I mean, I we see a number of clients that go through property developments and I have to be honest, anyone listening to this video, don't think it's a don't do it negative video because it's not really designed to do that, no. but it is designed to help you to understand the problems that you'll face. Um, we have, like I say, if I have three clients out of 10 that are successful in property development, I'm being generous. And I think the reason for that is because people, um, some instance, she had a great saying in one of my mastermind is, be careful of the shiny penny. And he's very tr- right in that, mm. in as much as someone talks about property development and then all of a sudden, oh, what's this property development about? And I've got to get involved in that. Do you see too much enthusiasm without due diligence being put on what they need to do as an individual, but also checking out what a deal really looks like? Yeah, without any doubt. It, it's... In many ways, if you buy the wrong house and convert it into the wrong HMO, you could be out of pocket, but it's probably out of equity pocket, effectively. The equity is still in the deal. You've just had to leave more of your own cash in. Whereas, you know, that's that's things measured in, you know, a few hundred 
to £500,000 or so. You start talking development, particularly in some of the expensive parts of the country, then, you know, the, the, everything is magnified. So those little slip-ups, and by the way, there's more slip-ups to making development, you know, can easily turn the thing completely upside down, whereby it's not just the equity that's not left in there. There is no equity, and you've still got cash in the deal because, you know, because there are not enough due diligence has been done. So, you know, wh whereas, in fact, I was talking to someone earlier today, and they were saying there was a time in their area where you could buy a certain type of house, convert it into a student HMO, and you know, and pretty much if you could breathe, you could make money at that because there was a formula that worked. They're now saying that doesn't work. And what they've realized as a business is their business can't quite pivot into a different market because everything they've got set up looks for one kind of property in one part of town. Right. And they're realizing that that's not working. In fact, that's why they've asked me to get involved and try and help them pivot their business into a little bit more you know, broader thinking as far as the conversions and refurbishments are going. Um, and, and that's, you know, I mean, it's good that they've realised that because they've realised they've got to step up their game and, you know, and change their model. Talking about sexy projects, we said it earlier, we was going to highlight it. Uh, the whole commercial to residential development, I mean, I'll, I'll add in my little pennies worth if you don't mind later on. Um, but from your perspective, why is it so sexy at the minute? Um, so, to be honest, it's sexy at the minute with the a lot of people who missed the boat when they should have been doing it. Right. So, so in 2013, I think it was about May, June time, 2013, the government relaxed the permitted development rights on commercial B1 to residential. And if you were on board then, which fortunately we did find one of those then, so we were on board early, we only got one, we had three or four flowing around at one point, but only one actually got over the line. Mm. But if you were in early happy days, if you were in a southern part of the country for the next few years, pretty good, then then it, it kind of rippled out away from London and, and went up to the Midlands, you had a, you had a longer window. Um, and it, there's still a window further, further north here. Um, but it was the big sexy thing because it was permitted development and everyone believed it was really easy to do because you didn't need planning permission. And since then, the government has plugged in a number of other permitted developments, you know, relating to flats above uh, shops and you know, industrial units and agricultural units and things like that. But what a lot of people have actually missed out is that Permitted development is a change of use. It doesn't allow you to move the front door. It doesn't allow you to put another couple of windows in the building. It only allows you to take what was an office and use it as residential. Um, and so a lot of people caught a cold because they bought properties that didn't actually work being converted without some further alterations for which they needed planning permission, which sometimes they didn't manage to achieve or they didn't get the best use out of it. Um, and it, so in many ways, the people that are still doing this, in some respects, are lazy. You know, they're, they're looking for this, what, what was a good thing, you know, five, four or five years ago, because they've missed the boat, really. And that's not to say there aren't deals out there now, but, you know, particularly where I am, I'm in, I'm in Kent. So in the southeast, there are not many commercial to residential deals now. You've got to be much more creative to make a deal out of anything down here now because the market it, you know, it was taken. That's not to say there aren't uh, commercial buildings coming on the market now, but the owners of those buildings know that if they get planning approved, they've suddenly increased the value of that property. And there's always a naive developer will come along and pay too much for it in an auction. And, and you're out anyway, so you've got to be more creative. And I think I'm seeing that starting to ripple up from London as well now. So investors, I think, and developers, particularly in the southeast, have been had to be more creative to add value. Now it's up towards Birmingham and heading up towards Manchester and Liverpool, um, you know, and up through the Midlands, where I'm seeing other people having to be creative and think a lot deeper and find other solutions and other ways to add value. Um, and, and now it's not so much just this commercial to residential conversion. It is, look, it is a whole concept, no matter what the property starts off as, we're converting it to residential now. 
and it's just called commercial to residential. Commercial to residential started off as business B1 to residential. Now it is anything that isn't residential at the moment, just gets lumped into that same bracket as an opportunity, but they're not all opportunities. And a lot of them, as I say, don't work on permitted development, which is where it all started. Mm. It's, it's interesting you should say that about what people listening to this video will be thinking now is, oh, I thought it was just their permitted development to change it from commercial into residential and make it look like a house. And that fine point of reading the details of what permitted development really is, is just the use class. Yeah. It is not a configuration change, which is what you've highlighted. I remember when I did my developments, it was, I, I went in knowing that I had to still go from planning permission to change the configurations internally as well as externally, because just simply changing the use class didn't do anything actually, which is probably you, you hiding to nothing because no one would rent in that property. And actually, if you had an exit strategy of trying to sell it, you probably wouldn't because it just looks awful. That, it, it, exactly. And so with what ended up happening was even now there's some poor quality conversions because they were done under permitted development without any additional creativity. Mm. Yeah. And in theory, you know, even putting a porch on the front needs planning permission. Um, but that porch can obviously just add a bit more interest to it. Um, but so, so we are partially blighted. We're blighted by two things as a result of this. One is some very bland conversions, which were done under permitted development. And we're also blighted by some very small units because there were no minimum space standards on any of these permitted developments. And I know some people have made a whole business out of small units and have really nailed the market with decent communal space and yeah, yeah, a, a, a lifestyle community. But I know lots of other people who haven't done that. And effectively, it's not much more than a glorified HMO, but with no communal space, just a slightly bigger bedroom than you might have in a standard HMO. Um, and again, I think some of those will, some of those people will find that they're in a in a market that disappears eventually, um, that they can't rent those rooms because it's better to come down to a good quality HMO or go up to a proper micro apartment type, type community. And talk about that kind of arrangement. I just wonder, we could talk about the negatives of COVID-19, but I think people have probably been absorbed too much in the negativity of COVID-19. Let's talk about the positive side of property developments. What do you see, uh, because of people now begin to think, well, I'm not going on holiday as much, or I might have to have an office in my house. What do you think the opportunities are in property development as we go through the rest of 2020 and into 2021? So, so I think I definitely agree with you going into 2021. I think now is not the time to be rushing into a development. I think we're going to see some fire sales out there. We're going to see some developers that have, yeah, are, are going to unfortunately um, yeah, cease to trade and there'll be some fire sales. And they're a risky thing, by the way, because um, yeah, who knows what you're taking over there. Um, but, but as far as, yeah, I've, I've been thinking and working with some of my clients as to what is the next generation of property. And you're dead right, Simon. There are going to be more people wanting to work from home. So, so even if you're if you're doing you know fairly regular, let's say state take an HMO for instance, is there space in an HMO where two or three of the tenants could work from home, perhaps in a communal space? Maybe you need a bigger communal space. Certainly, an HMO that we're doing for ourselves at the moment, we're looking at putting desk spacing space in the bedrooms, um, more like you would for a student bedroom but for professionals thinking that some of them will want to work from home. We're looking at kind of bar counters areas as well, because that's a little bit more like the coffee shop environment where you just perch on a stall and do some work. I think if I was doing, yeah, it, it, going into larger properties, certainly if I was doing houses, I'd be looking uh, to, into, to put in studies and things like that, um, because I think I can see a lot more people wanting to work from home. But, but I think on a slight tangent here, I'm pretty certain there's a market for 
uh, for decent shared office space in the centre of town. Kind, I'm kind of thinking the Starbucks Costa type model, but on a membership basis. No, no, yeah, none of the school kids coming in at three thirty or anything like that. Where it's it's a, a sensible level. You haven't got the radio on full blast, um, but I I can see a market for that because I can see a lot of people wanting to work from home and realizing after a short time that actually it can be quite lonely in the spare bedroom on your own um, and that actually it's a little bit more exciting to be you know in the town and and you know in a in a community kind of thing and i can see being attached to those i think yeah there'll be a print little printer attached to it there'll be the computer repair attached to it there'll probably be a nursery school upstairs yeah that, i can see those kinds of things coming and and yeah, you know, that this is me. This is me thinking of what's the next best thing. I'd quite like to be there in a, you know eighteen months' time or so. I don't think it's coming yet, but I think if you've got the right property now, that would be where I'd be looking. If you've got a commercial property, fairly central location, good parking, um, I think I'd be looking at that from a commercial perspective, um, rather than trying to convert it into residential, which may not be appropriate in the in the high street anyway. Yeah. So that's a bit of a curveball for you. There's an interesting perspective on the 2020 um, side of things, because you mentioned 2020 could be the year of not doing property developments. And I'm hearing the same thing in terms of material prices have now escalated because of scarcity. We've got laborers now charging maybe 20% more because again, there is a, a demand there, but not so many tradespeople being able to work in the conditions they would want to. It's a good thing to talk about saving your money in 2020, then invest in 2021, and maybe focusing on your business or other income streams to make the best opportunities for 2021. Which yeah. leads me to the final question, really, for you, Martin. You know, if someone's got, we talked just before the, the show actually of saying, if someone had fifty thousand pounds of money, what would they do with that money? And you quite rightly said it needs to be hundred thousand pounds. So, why don't you first of all explain why it's hundred thousand pounds instead of fifty thousand pounds? Because I'm sure people would be interested to hear that viewpoint. And if you did have hundred thousand pounds in 2021, what would you suggest people do with that money? So, so the reason I said hundred thousand pounds and not fifty thousand pounds is because I'm based in Kent. So you don't get a lot for fifty thousand pounds. I guess there are parts of the country where you know, you'd get a three-bedroom semi for fifty thousand pounds cash, and, uh, and and be good to go. But I'm thinking if we're talking about larger commercial developments, uh, greenfield building a you know, a pair of semi-detached houses or whatever, I, I, I've always felt for a long time that it's not actually that difficult to get finance for development-type products. Um, and the reason for that is there's pretty much a formula. If you can prove at least 20% and probably 25% margin on your development with realistic figures, and you can prove your credibility or the credibility of the team that's around you, then you will easily get finance for that development. And generally, you'll get 100% finance on the build and 60-ish percent loan to value on the original purchase price so now you've got to find that odd 40 odd percent that's in there and possibly your consultants fees different lenders have got different terms in there so you know that you get a fairly small project um, and a hundred thousand pounds will be that deposit your consultants and cash flow for the first month just in case you know the, the first month's payment doesn't come through but we draw down payments that really shouldn't be a bit of a it shouldn't be any kind of problem so i think that's why it's a hundred thousand pounds where would i be putting my money do you know i i, I don't think it matters for me I, I would be putting my money on anything where i felt i could add value so i need to be happy that i can start with a figure and i can add significant amount of value onto that and if i can do that in a creative way particularly if I can structure a deal up using uh, maybe exchange for delay completion options. I'm working on something at the moment that's going to be vendor finance. In fact, where we're buying his company that owns some um, some uh, property. Might be needed to talk to you about that separately, Simon. Um, but, you know, I, so I think 
you use it creatively. If you, if you're going to an estate agent or a commercial agent looking to spend your hundred thousand pounds, you're you're going to get the bare minimum return on that. Delve deeper, look creatively. If you're going to do development, my advice is don't do anything more than maximum an hour and a half away from where you live because you want to be there. Ideally, if it's your first one, do it closer than an hour from home. But it doesn't matter what you do, but be happy that you can add value that is significantly more than that, effectively, that 100 grand would give. I was talking to someone the other day, and they said, I've got this great deal, Martin. Can you help me look at the figures? What do you think? And I said, what? So let me get this clear. You're leaving your £50,000 in here, having spent whatever you was going to spend, and you're going to you're going to earn about six percent on that. I said, let me give you an idea. Do you think there's some property investors out there that would give you more than six percent on that? And the guy said, yeah. And then we were actually we delved deeper, and it turned out he was spending more on this property than the value he was adding on. So he was creating an additional bedroom in the basement, which was going to add fifteen grand of value and cost him twenty five grand to do. And let's not forget, Martin, on that point, and this is probably a good point to conclude on this matter, to be honest, where people do get into property development and they talk about how much value they're getting out of the property deal, but they don't value their time. They certainly mm -hmm. don't value the stress levels that they have. They certainly don't value the time that they're taking from another venture, whether that's a business income stream, and now are kind of getting less of a return on their development. So it's good that you're raising these points. And I think to, to conclude on that point, really, it's for anyone getting in property development, make sure you reach out to the experts. Don't do it yourself. You could, like I say, seven out of 10 of our clients that do property developments without proper support and due diligence really are pretty miserable at the end of it. And, I have to have many, many conversations about exit strategies, and it's not a pleasant exit strategy either. So mm. you do need to get the experts. Which kind of leads me to the final question, Martin. How do people get hold of you if they are thinking about doing a property environment and realize that actually I've bitten off more than I can chew? Uh, I need some help here. So, so the easiest way to get hold of me is to go to my website, which is uh, www.refurbishmentmasterclass.com. Dot co dot uk top right hand corner there's a button that says book a call and uh, it'll take you straight through to my diary um, you can book a you can f book a free uh, 20 minute call just to talk through what you've got there's other call options on there as well if you want a budget and feasibility then you can do that on there and other things you'll see there but just start from the website and it'll take you straight to the diary rather than try and phone me or send me emails which get lost in the system um, booking it in the diary means that I'm definitely sitting behind a table waiting for your call when you come through. So I'd much rather talk to any developer or any anyone looking at doing any kind of anything, re, you know, basic refurbishment upwards, much rather talk to you yeah, early on. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll happily help you out when it's gone wrong. And unfortunately, I get a lot of clients that ring me at that point. And, and it's like, you, you should have just phoned me. I could have just pointed you in the right direction, told you who could help you or guided you to make sure you were doing the right thing. So. Yeah, just do get in touch and um, you know, I'd, I'd much rather help you before it goes wrong, but I can bail you out if it has gone wrong, but let's hope that doesn't happen. Great. Martin, thank you ever so much for your time today and hopefully you guys listening at home to this have taken a lot of value from what Martin's has shared with you, but also do make sure that you drop in your questions and I will liaise with Martin to get answers to your questions and uh, I shall look forward to seeing you on the next video.